Hey, I'm Hypermobile, and if you're listening to this, I'm guessing that you might be too. Hi, my name is Alex, and I'm your Hypermobile host, and today we are talking about a highly requested topic. We are talking about intimacy. So if you are someone who this would not be the right thing for you to listen to right now, if you're someone who maybe is not the right age or you're not feeling up for content that would be a bit adult in nature, this is the time for you to go check out one of my other episodes. You can find all of them on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and of course you can find them on my uh, website, uh, hypermobilityhq.com. It has just all been redone. It is looking fantastic. There are blog posts, there's a little shop. Go check it out. There's actually a little quiz too that I I think is super cute but go check it out let me know what you think and if you want to see archived episodes that's a good place too but um for today we are talking about sex we're talking about sex because somebody needs to talk about sex <laughs> when you go and look up hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome and sex or look up like kind of searches online to try and see what research has been done or what books has this been talked about in there's not much there so today you're going to get my thoughts on why I think hypermobile people have so many issues um, when it comes to sex, some of the common conditions that aren't really talked about enough um, that people think they're alone in, but really they're actually quite common in this patient population that have to do with hyper hypermobility and sex. Ugh, so many big words today. And I'm going to talk th you through two of the most common injuries involving sex that I hear about from patients and some clinical strategies that I use in terms of just reducing um, or sorry stopping those injuries from happening or just reducing uh, the ways in which they affect these people. Um, as well, I do want to stress if you're looking for a community for an awesome, super incredible online community, I cannot recommend enough the Hypermobility HQ Discord. It is a private membership, so it's £9.99 per month, and it is for the scientifically minded hypermobile person to share thoughts, ideas, and strategies, and just experiences on what it's like to really live in a hypermobile body. As I said already, the community is incredible. Um, I wasn't sure what it was going to be like when I made it, but it has become my favorite corner of the internet by far. There are weekly lives with yours truly talking about all kinds of subjects. Last week, we talked about disability and what does disability even mean? And are all hypermobile people disabled? Anyways, that was a really good one. Um, we also have guest speakers. We have a monthly Q&A and we have special events. Um, so yeah, the Christmas party was awesome. <laughs> but anyways, if that interests you, again, you can find more info on my website, but without further delay, let's get into today's episode. <laughs> and one last delay. Medical disclaimer, of course, this is not medical advice. If you are having a health issue of any kind, I urge you to go speak directly to your medical doctor um, regarding it, because we always want to be safe. Uh, and here we're just talking about kind of some anatomy, some physiology, and we're talking about stuff that's for informational purposes only. So if you're worried, please go seek out appropriate medical care. Now, Hypermobility and sex. Why is it such a problem? Well, there's a couple things going on. Uh, we have, of course, um, to think always. This is this is how my brain works. I, I hope it helps you. But I always think about hypermobile hypermobile people and injuries in the context of mechanical issues. So that's that wonky collagen that's kind of affecting things from a structural perspective. That's those dislocations, subluxations, or partial dislocations and muscle injuries and so on. That's that category. But we also have, of course, the neurological component as well. Like for sex to, you know, and there are many ways people can have sex. <laughs> They're like infinite ways. But for a lot of different sexual um, acts to happen, there are certain autonomic nervous system functions that take place. So for example, um, in order for someone to have an erection, there are certain things that have to go on with blood pressure and blood flow direction, all these things. And that's due, that happens due to a component of your autonomic nervous system. It's that kind of behind the scenes. It's not like you can just will it to happen magically. It's something which happens um, kind of seemingly magically on its own until it doesn't. And then it gets really, really um, frustrating for that individual sometimes. And as well, of course, you have to think of things from an um, inflammatory perspective too. And there's a psychological component. So hypermobile people have issues with often many of these things. But let's get let's go one by one. Let's keep it simple, okay? So, from a mechanical perspective, the problem with a lot of different um, ways in which people have sex is that we have irregular movements happening. We have people doing movements that they haven't done ever or for a long time or that they certainly don't do regularly. We have legs going up, we have people lying in kind of awkward positions. And although that might be okay for someone with normal connective tissue, for someone who's hypermobile, the consequences of doing that can be much worse. Instead of having, I don't know, like 
uh, shoulder pain for like a couple days after a, maybe an adventurous experience with uh, their partner or partners, you can have someone who goes on to have like really serious and disabling neck pain for the rest of their life following something that was seemingly just a normal thing to do, right? So we have the the environment, we have the situation where we can have injuries occur with more problematic consequences. We also, of course, have activities which often require a repetitive motion. So again, um, there's a lot of repetitive hand motions, repetitive hip motions. We have a lot of repetitive things going on. And in general, I find that that is the kind of highest risk type of activity for a hypermobile body. These patients will often be fine doing a movement once. You know, if I ask a patient, say with shoulder pain, say it's like a sports, you know, a, a rotator cuff strain type presentation, and I ask them to raise their arm overhead once, they'll be fine. They won't have any pain. But if they raise their arm overhead, like, 50 times, that's when they start to get that pain. It happens after that repetitive um, motion. So a lot of sexual um, activities that people do involve repetitive motions, and that can be really problematic for hypermobile people. Of course, when we look at it from an autonomic nervous system perspective, there is a lot of stuff that needs to happen in sequence, in the right order, at the right time, and in the right way. We talked about erections briefly. Um, to go talk to talk about people with vaginas and vulvas, let's talk about arousal. So uh, people think that you are just supposed to magically <laughs> become all lubricated and like ready to go, and that does not happen necessarily for everyone, especially not for patients who are hypermobile. And that can have to do with issues involving dysautonomia. Um, so dys means like negative, like it's not working so well. Autonomia, again, refers to that component of your nervous system that does all the magical things that are just supposed to magically happen. Like, for example, digestion of food. I'm not telling my stomach to digest my food right now. It's just doing it, luckily, which is great. <laughs> but um, when it comes to arousal, not only do we have, of course, potentially that person with a vagina, they're not able to produce that lubricative fluid, they're not producing that arousal fluid, um, and that's causing the tissue to be dry, which again is going to increase their risk of injury potentially. So that's leading, you know, that's a autonomic nervous system issue, which is potentially leading to a mechanical issue. But we also have, on top of that, the potential for um, psychological harm from that. That person might think, oh, my body should just get aroused. That's the normal thing to do. Everyone else does it. Like, why Why should I not be able to do it? It's the, it's the same thing with erections again. People think, oh, I should just be able to have that happen. Um, but it's not happening for me. And there's a lot of, I think, feeling like a failure. I think feeling like a physical failure is a huge problem when it comes to being a hypermobile person. And it's something which we need to, um, I think, talk about more as a community. I, I hope that people understand if there's one takeaway from this episode, it's that I promise you, you are not alone in whatever issue you're experiencing involving um, what we're talking about today. Now, we talked about the mechanical issues, the connective tissue and joint injuries and so on. We talked about um, the autonomic nervous system and problems regarding that stuff that's just supposed to happen that sometimes doesn't happen. Now we are going to talk about the inflammatory issues that can arise. So a lot of hypermobile people, um, especially again, people with vaginas, they're going to have issues with things like chronic yeast infections, chronic urinary tract infections. Um, these will be things often that they'll have treated and they'll come back and they'll get them treated again. Um, these kind of chronic undulating infections. This happens partially because I think that these patients are not being seen by medical doctors who have a deep understanding of hypermobile connective tissue and how it affects people who have these infections. So hypermobile patient with, for example, a yeast infection or thrush is being given standard treatment, which is not working for them when they need a, an appropriate treatment for their presentation and maybe that higher level of clinical management. But having those types of issues makes that person potentially associate their vagina and their vulva and that whole region with pain. It also might make them feel like a, pa a failure because they can't be available for a penetrative sex or sex involving those regions when their partner maybe wants them to if these infections are near constant, which they really can be for some people. So we have that inflammatory <laughs> component as well. And then on top of all that, we have the psychological component. So I will um, hear sometimes from patients and from this community about people who feel like failures because their partner wants to do certain sex acts, they can't do them or they need to do them in a modified way. And um, their partner is not being what a, a partner needs to be. Their partner is not being supportive and loving and caring and solution oriented. Instead, their partner is really putting them down and really adding to that. And that 
type of um, interaction, I think long term, especially for patients who are younger, sets them up to be in really, really harmful and potentially even abusive relationship situations long term because they've been told they're the problem, their body is, uh, you know, the failure, like they're the they're the whole issue in this relationship. If only their body worked better, if only they could do this, then things would be all, you know, sunshine and roses. And again, that's that's often not the case. So there are all types of different ways that these issues interact. And I think that's what makes it so challenging and so nuanced when thinking about hypermobility and sex. Now, I also want to stress that as much as we can have like these seemingly like, you know, isolated issues, there are actually a lot of medical terms and medical diagnoses for conditions involving pain during sex. So we talked about dyspareunia, which affects um, about 30% of the population was a statistic I read online. Again, check the show notes. I'll put some research down there. You can check check out my stats. And if I get anything wrong, you can email me. Um, we also have things like vulvodynia, uh, vestibulodynia, and vaginismus. So uh, again, when I hear about these things from patients, they often think that they are the only person that I've ever heard of who has this. No. Vulvodynia and vaginismus are common when I'm doing a medical history with patients who have um, who have vaginas and vulvas. Again, I want to stress I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a UK registered osteopath, but it is part of my medical history when I talk with a patient to understand their health on a more like holistic level. I want to know about their respiratory respiratory system, their cardiovascular system, and even their reproductive system because it's all connected, as as we all know too well. Anyways. Um, Vaginismus and vulvodynia affect approximately, I think statistics say about 10% of the population. I suspect that number would be much higher, but I think it's really underreported and under-researched. It's very difficult to find research discussing hypermobility and sex. And again, this is something which I think people should research more and should talk about more because I know it really is hurtful and upsetting for a lot of um, patients and the community members I hear from who, who are going through this stuff. Uh, as well, the reason why it's important to get these things diagnosed is that there are sometimes different treatment and management options out there. Um, there are there's a whole class of physiotherapists called pel- pel- <laughs> losing my words called a pelvic floor physiotherapist, and I do hear sometimes about patients who've had life changing and wonderful experiences with their pelvic floor physiotherapist. So there are options, um, but step one, of course, is understanding what's going on. So. As well, we need to think about other conditions which aren't appreciated and aren't discussed enough. Um, One which in particular I think that we need more research on in its relationship to hypermobility and HEDS and HSD is Peyronie's disease. So that's P-E-Y-R-O-N-I-E apostrophe S disease. And this condition is when you get uh, what they refer to as a plaque. But when you read in in research, it's often also called scar tissue as well. So I'm just going to use the word scar tissue here because it fits more consistently with how I talk about injury and hypermobile tissue. But we have scar tissue formation within the penis, which affects its ability to... um, to, sh- to have an erection, basically. It starts to have um, issues with that because we have the tissue, which needs to be kind of, you know, ha- be able to accommodate the shape of the erection. We have scar tissue and injury there, and that can be really, really painful for people. Um, men make up a, a small minority of the symptomatic patients who are hypermobile. So again, with a, with a condition, let's say, for example, HEDS, it's autosomal dominant. So theoretically, the split should be 50-50. In clinic, I should see half males and half females or half half patients who are XY and half patients who are XX, right? Theoretically. Um, and of course, there are other versions. I like. There are so many different presentations we can have from chromosomes and um, different gender identities and so on. But in theory, it should be a 50-50 split if we just look at it in that really simple way. But I see a vast majority of females because they tend to be the ones who are more um, symptomatic. These people who are kind of have these estrogen um, dominant hormonal profiles. These are the ones who are more symptomatic. We'll do an episode on that <laughs> probably in a month or two. But um, I see a smaller percentage of people who are testosterone dominant. And I really think that although, of course, we need to talk about the issues that affect these more estrogen dominant patients, we need to not forget <laughs> about the people who are testosterone dominant and the, the males who are affected by these symptoms, you know, they matter too. <laughs> so Peyronie's disease, it's not talked about enough. There is no research that's been done, as far as I can see, investigating a, a potential link to HEDS or HSD. Uh, 
But my hunch is that it's going to be um, something which is very much correlated and maybe even a, a comorbidity for some of these pay for uh, this particular group of hypermobile individuals who have a penis. <laughs> so it's something which we need to talk about more. Um, it's one of those conditions, again, where injury, it's a, it's a consequence of cumulative injury. So the penis gets injured and scar tissue forms and it's inappropriate scar tissue formation and poor tissue healing, which again, if you know anything about hypermobility, you're like, ah, oh, this, this sounds very similar to how injuries happen in other parts of hypermobile bodies. But um, it's something where we certainly do need more attention being brought to it. And uh, we need to make sure that these patients are being identified early and getting the right medical treatment and the right support. Now, moving on, we are going to talk about two issues that I hear from commonly in patients and what I, you know, kind of the strategies or thoughts I have about positively affecting those issues. So when it comes to sex and intimacy, the two most common issues that I hear about are hip pain and wrist pain. Um, hip pain, obviously, this is particularly um, an issue for people who are lying on their back sometimes with their legs out. Uh, that can be, you know, really challenging on the hip joints and on some of the connective tissue there and wrist pain for patients who are putting their, their body weight through their wrists. Now, hip pain first. <laughs> so hips are joints, which again, are underappreciated in the assessment of hypermobile patients. The Baton scale does not really look at hips. Some people argue that touching the floor assesses hip mobility. I think it looks at arm length more than hip mobility. But anyways, <laughs> hips are not appreciated enough in terms of the assessment of hypermobile patients. Um, in order to really assess someone's hip from an, from an orthopedic perspective, that patient needs to be lying on their back on the table. You need to be moving the hip around. You need to have done it a lot and been trained in it. And ideally, of course, you would have some medical imaging on top of that. The reason I say that is because as much as we can and do see issues with the connective tissue in people's hips, the ligaments and the muscle and all these different components, the tendons and so on, we also see issues very actually quite commonly, I would say, with the bones themselves. So there are different um, anatomical presentations or conditions that people can have where their their femur, their, their femur, eh, their femur, or the kind of the um, the socket. If we have a ball and socket joint in the hip, we have the, the ball, which is the femur, the socket, which is the acetabulum and the bones can be shaped differently. So sometimes we have more of a, a bony issue than a connective tissue issue. Sometimes um, we have both, which makes a more challenging management of that uh, patient presenting with that injury. But we need to know what's going on in the hip. So if you're someone who's having pain during sex in your hips, please speak to your appropriately qualified healthcare provider because hopefully they will help you get the right investigations and figure out that diagnosis for you. But in terms of hip pain during sex, what I think really causes this pain is the fact that the patient has to just kind of hold their legs in that position. And interestingly, it's often a position that I use to provoke symptoms in a patient in clinic. So in my assessment as an osteopath, I want to see like what makes the pain worse, what makes the pain better. And when I take that patient's hip into flexion, so I'm bringing their knee up toward their chest and abduction, so I'm moving their knee slightly out, that is often a range of motion which makes the patient's pain worse. And funnily enough, if you can imagine lying on your back with your knee coming up toward your chest and your, your thigh going slightly out, that is a position which a lot of people use routinely when they have sex and holding it there. I'm not surprised that that is causing pain for a lot of people. So what can you do? Step one is going to be to just have a lot of pillows, bolsters, supports. I've talked about positions of true rest in previous episodes. Um, I was on the Book Gang podcast actually recently talking about true rest um, and supported body positions when reading. So you can go check that out as well. I might try and uh, link it in the show notes too. But we want to find ways that you can essentially prop up your body. So if you have pillows. If you don't have pillows, you can use like folded up sweaters or whatever. Get stuff, shove those things outside your hips. Okay. You want them shut. You want them pressing up against your lateral thigh. And by doing that, you're creating kind of a scaffolding so that your legs can then relax. And that is going to really reduce um, how much those symptoms in the hips are aggravated most likely. As well, um, if you have the budget for it or the space, you can go buy all types of foam blocks. There is a whole world of kit you can buy <laughs> for having sex. So you could go and say, you know what, I want some wedges, like, you know, like um, those like slices of cheese. I got, everyone knows what a wedge is. You can get a wedge, basically a wedge pillow. You could get two wedge cushions and have your legs resting against the 
those beautifully. And that could be really, really comfy for you. Now, I think a lot of people get self-conscious and they're like, oh, this sounds like so much setup. This is so elaborate. Think back. If, if you have like a, a partner that you're thinking of in mind, think back to when you first met them. You probably spent hours getting ready. You were probably like making sure you're doing extra stuff in the shower. You were probably, if you're putting on makeup, being really precise in that. You were probably like, I don't know, looking for dust, like at the top of the door frame. Like you were going around your flat and making sure that it looked perfect. It's okay to take that same amount of attention and detail and continue to have that as a component of your sex life. Um, there's this idea that we just have to be like ready to go at a moment's notice. And that's not possible for people who have chronic um, injuries, chronic illness and people who are disabled. So I think just really lean into that, that indulgence, like indulge yourself, make it an event, make it fun, because that's going to help you long term. And I think it could be really fun for your partner too. <laughs> now, on top of that, if you are someone who's okay to look at more elaborate things, there are different like chairs and devices and things you can like hang from your ceiling. Be safe, be safe. But it could be kind of fun to look into the whole world of supported sex devices out there. Um, I might do a blog post on this. If I do, check it out. There'll be some good stuff in there. Now, um, on top of that, you can also look at braces and supports. Um, so something which can certainly affect uh, pain during sex is dysautonomia. So again, for patients who have issues with regulating their, their blood pressure and where blood flow is going, some of these patients find um, compressive garments helpful. They find like compress compression socks, for example, really helpful. What I would love to see, I don't know if it exists, and I, I think I read about someone doing this online, so if I can find the original post online, I will. But you could take like a pair of high-waisted compression stockings and just, um, you know, adjust the groin area if you needed to do that. But that way you're keeping that compression going, you're taking care of yourself, you're prioritizing your health and your body, but you're still able to do what you want to do with your partner potentially. So don't be shy to do like, I call it arts and crafts. If you have a problem and there's a reasonable way you can have a solution, just go for it and just make it like a style. Now, on top of that, we talked earlier about that knee being bent kind of toward the chest. I find that typically patients are comfiest in what I call like a, a mid range, right? So instead of having the knee up as close to your chest, it might be helpful to have that kind of knee further away and in more of a mid range flexion position. And of course you could just be changing positions routinely as well. Changing positions is a great way to not be in any position for too long. And that's going to help to reduce your injury rate. Now, on top of that, if we look at wrist issues, you can certainly look into braces. So again, the wrist pain I hear about, it's kind of like a plank. So you know when people are doing a plank in like a Pilates class and they get wrist pain, it's really common in patients who are hypermobile because their wrists, some of their wrists are just really, really slender. We see a lot of patients with arachnodactyly with different changes in the hand and the wrist anatomy, and their wrist is not able to support their body weight or even part of their body weight. As well, these patients have excessive ranges of motion. I was shocked. I have very hypermobile wrists and I was shocked when I realized the normal range of motion and what I have and what I see in my lot of, a lot of my patients because it is far outside the realms of, what's cons of what is normal range of motion. So having a little bit of extra support can be helpful. Now, can you wear a medical brace in bed? Yeah, of course you can. You can wear a medically prescribed brace. There are all kinds. You can talk with your um, healthcare provider. You can get rigid braces, soft braces. There, there's a whole world of, of braces waiting out there for you should you want those or should you need them? But you can also look at alternative strategies. So one of my favorites, oh, I do have it here. You can get just like a, an Olympic weightlifting wrist wrap uh, support. <laughs> so I got into these through my work with weightlifter patients initially back when I was working primarily with sports people. I'm going to hold it up. If you're watching my video, you can see it. But there's a strip of fabric with just a little kind of piece of, I don't know, like a shoelace on the end almost, like a fabric ribbon. And you can just loop it around your wrist and that creates a beautiful little brace. And you could do them in different colors and have different ways of having support. You can find all kinds online. So that can be a really simple cost-effective brace. You can um, get different ones. Like I've seen them as low as kind of like, I don't know, under 10 pounds and as high as like 20 pounds. So these are awesome. Um, you can find them on my Amazon shop. You can also get, of course, um, different kinds of tape. So some patients love tape. Some patients hate tape. Uh, the people who hate tape, myself included, they normally hate tape because they get hives. There can be like a sensory ick, but also they might just get a rash, which is a very reasonable reason to 
hate tape. Um, but what we need to not forget about is there is tape out there that adheres to itself. So you can get this tape in the very kind of sports tape looking way. It'll be kind of like that um, kind of tan color. Um, it's You know, maybe it's the look you want in your sex life. Maybe it's not the look you want. If it's not the look that you want or if you can do with like a different kind of support, there are different kinds of tape. This, for example, is tape that has a, a different finish. It's kind of like a red glossy finish and it adheres to itself. And you can do all kinds of things with this tape, including make wrist braces. So this might be a really good option. And finally, of course, when you're looking at um, more elaborate, elaborate, elaborate lingerie setups, um, there are so many things going on. Corsets, Hypermobile people, a lot of them really like corsets. They like that support. Um, there are these little, like, I, I call them gauntlets. I don't know if there's a word for them. I've seen them in, like, a window display before. But basically, they're, like, little wrist corsets. Does that make any sense? But things that you lace up near your wrist. Now, if someone could design some of those that are more supportive, that would be awesome for hypermobile people. And if they could look gorgeous at the same time, that would be even better. So the world is your oyster when it comes to supports. And it's all about taking those same principles that help you throughout your day, things like bracing or minimal bracing, things like finding positions of, of true rest or supported body positions and applying them to your sex life. And I think it really comes to just at the end of the day, um, accepting like your body is your body and it has certain needs and it is going to help you long-term if you address those needs. And hopefully the people that you're doing this with, if you're doing it with anyone, and if you're not, and you're just on your own, hey, that's great too. Like indulge you, enjoy you, you know, make sure if you're on your own, I hope that you're taking really good care of yourself. But if you're with other people, they should be caring about you and the needs of your body too. If you need to stop, if you need to take a break, it's, it's just like if you were doing a, an exercise program, like take that break. There's no shame in that. And then come back when you feel ready or come back to it another day. I hope that you found this discussion um, helpful. I hope that maybe it's got the conversation rolling for some people because hypermobile people and people who have chronic health conditions, they deserve and need to be able to have the best sex possible in my opinion. And I hope that I've at least given you some ideas from today's episode. I can't wait to have you back next time. I'm so happy to be back. I missed this and we'll catch you later. Take care. Bye.